So let's take a closer look at the criminal justice system in the, in the United States um, and why it is problematic from a sociological perspective. So conflict theorists argue that the criminal justice system in the U.S. is set up to privilege people with money. Um, conflict theorists, again, remember they're very much viewing how society is built by people with power and how uh, those individuals use their power to build structures in our society that enable them to maintain it. Well, prisons are no exception here. Um, conflict theorists argue that people with power have set up our prison system in a way that enables people with power to maintain it. Okay, In this case, uh, <clears throat> prisons serve in many ways to enable to ensure that there is a class divide in the United States. Um, so for example, if you are arrested, and you can't afford to pay bail, you have to remain incarcerated until your court date. Now this could be months, so keep that in mind. If you can't afford to hire an attorney, you will be appointed a public defender. And public defenders are notoriously overworked lawyers and they're underpaid, and they can rarely dedicate their full attention to any of their cases. Now this isn't throwing shade on public defenders, it's a very selfless job to become a public defender, but the reality is, is that they are very much overworked. They don't have um, an adequate number of public offenders so that each individual who is being um, brought to trial has a lawyer that can really dedicate the time that they need to their case even if they were convicted for something that they didn't actually do their public defender might not be able to dedicate enough time to get the charges dropped because they just don't have the resources to do that so regardless of their guilt or their innocence defendants who have been appointed public defenders will typically be encouraged to take a plea bargain wherein defenders plead guilty in exchange for a lesser prison sentence. So think about how messed up this whole system is, right? If you get arrested for something and you can't afford to pay your bail, that means you have to stay in jail until your court date. So think about that. If you get arrested, say you get pulled over and the police officer or whoever is accusing you of, you know, possessing some sort of drug. Maybe it wasn't even your drug. Maybe, you know, you were giving someone a ride and they dropped a bag of cocaine in your back seat and you got pulled over and you got busted for it. You know, imagine that this happened to you. Now you get to jail and you don't have the money to pay your bail. So you have to stay in jail until your court date. Well, you're obviously going to get fired from your job. You know, if you don't show up to work for weeks or months because you can't get out of jail because you can't afford your bail, you're going to lose your job. So even if you get out of this charge, you're already going to be at a disadvantage when you get out of jail because you're now unemployed. And then beyond that, if you can't afford bail, you most likely can't afford to hire a private attorney. So you're going to get someone assigned to your case who's overworked and underpaid. And their main objective here is just going to try and get you the out of a really bad situation and oftentimes what that means is asking people to plead guilty even if they didn't really do the crime they're being accused of simply because pleading guilty is going to get them a lesser sentence so now here you are jobless right even if you plead guilty maybe you avoid going to prison but now you have a criminal record so it's going to be even more difficult for you to get a job on the outside now because a lot of employers don't hire people that have a felony or a criminal record uh, on their applications, right? So it's a really, really messed up system in that regard, and it contributes to this problem that we call mass incarceration, which refers to the growth of incarcerated population over the past several decades and the social, political, and economic conditions that caused it. Uh, today, there's about 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States. Now, while the U.S. only accounts for about 4.5% of the world's population, the U.S. accounts for 25% of the world's incarcerated population. 25%. One-fourth of all incarcerated people in the world are incarcerated in the United States. Now, as sociologists who study patterns of human behavior here, this should be a big red flag, right? Again. If we would expect that nothing is wrong with our incarceration system, since we only occupy 4.5% of the world's population, we would expect that we should also have about 4.5% of the world's incarcerated population. Yet we have more than five times that amount, at 25% of the world's incarcerated population. So we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. By far, no country even comes close to our incarceration rate. 
Now, even though crime rates have significantly dropped since the 1990s, the incarceration rate in the U.S. has increased by 500% in the past 40 years. So think about these numbers. Think about this data here, because this is a very strong indication of a social problem, right? We have a, the world's highest incarceration rate. Our incarceration rate has increased by 500% over the past four decades, despite the reality that crime rates have actually dropped. So why is it that we in the United States are incarcerating so many people? Well, let's take a little bit of a historical look here at some policies that have been passed in, our, in the U.S. that have contributed to this rise in mass incarceration. Tough on crime policies were put in place in the late 80s and the early 90s to fight this war on drugs in America, a topic that we'll talk more about in the coming weeks in this course. Um, but these laws included what are called three strike laws, which required anyone that was convicted of a third felony to automatically receive a mandatory sentence. Now this might seem like a fair policy to many people, right? You might think, well, yeah, if a person gets charged for th their third felony, they probably should do a good amount of time in jail. However, this law did not take into account that some minor crimes are actually considered as felonies. Remember, crimes, what we uh, decide to label as a criminal act is something that is socially constructed in our society. The same thing is true with felonies. You know, we as a society decided what crimes get labeled as just being a misdemeanor versus what gets labeled as a felony, which carries a much heavier sentence. So this led to some really unanticipated consequences of these three strike laws, because people that were committing crimes that seemed to be fairly trivial, that really shouldn't carry that much of a sentence, were getting slapped with these massive prison sentences and boosting, jacking up, literally inflating our incarcerated population at these extraordinary rates that we just talked about. A few examples of this, a 27 year old man uh, stole a pizza. All right. Yes, bad thing to do, you shouldn't steal, but for stealing a pizza, since it was his third strike, he got sentenced to 25 years in prison for stealing a pizza, lost 25 years of his life. Another man wrote a bad check for $94 and was sentenced to 25 years to life for writing a bad check. Now think about this. Writing a bad check could have been a complete innocent accident, right? Maybe he didn't balance his checkbook well. Maybe he thought he had more money in his account than he didn't. We don't even know the context of this. But for writing a bad check for $94, for $94, this individual lost his life to prison because of this three strike rules. So again, it's just this kind of unorthodox and bizarre rule that we have, this bureaucratic rule just for the sake of having this three strike law on the books. It's causing people who are committing these pretty trivial crimes to get locked up for the rest of their life. So when you're serving a life sentence for these silly crimes like this, it's easy to see how quickly our prison population could accumulate and rapidly explode to this point that we now house one fourth of the incarcerated population of the entire world and that we have the highest incarceration rates in the world in the U.S. as well. So these are contributing to what we refer to now as the prison industrial complex. These tough on crime policies resulted in a drastically higher rate of incarceration and public prisons started running out of room. So to save money, the government actually started to contract out in uh, private prisons or what they're more commonly referred to as for-profit prisons. So private pri prisons are essentially businesses that get paid for the number of inmates that they obtain. So this contributes to the prison industrial complex, uh, and, uh, which is an American phenomenon, which prisons are becoming a private industry set up to make a profit. Now this might sound pretty bizarre, uh, but here's a video that goes into a little more detail and approaches this with a bit of humor to explain what this prison industrial complex is. Adam, you got me into this? No, you get me out. I promise I have someone working on it. But in the meantime, this is a great opportunity to explain why our nation's prison system is a failure on every level. <laughs> so you know a lot about prisons? I bet you watch a lot of PBS documentaries, huh? I guess you're right. I do like first-hand knowledge. Oh, maybe you could help me do this episode? Sure. Nothing better to do. Whoa. Do you have magic TV powers like Adam? Nope. But I got a lot of favors. 
Early lunch today. Early lunch today, everyone. America's prison system is a total mess. Whatever purpose you think it serves, it ain't doing it. Well, the point of prison is to reduce crime. It's definitely not doing that. There are 2.2 million people incarcerated in the U.S., 10 times more than 50 years ago. Two million is more than the population of some states. Welcome to mass incarceration of Massachusetts. Our primary export, shiz. Our secondary export, God. Hey, that's contraband. But despite this massive increase in the prison population, a study conducted by the NYU School of Law found that the effect on the crime rate has been essentially zero. Zero? Then why do we lock so many people up? Well, I can't speak for all prisons, but this one is here to make money. Make money? You mean someone is profiting from all this? Yep, these guys are. It all started in the tough-on-crime 80s, when the war on drugs meant state and federal prisons were bursting at the seams. So many prisoners, what do we do? Let corporate America handle your prisons. We'll take care of everything, save you a few bucks, and skim a little off the top. Well, businesses running prisons? That sounds a little fishy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, hey, if it saves money, right? <laughs> And so the Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, was born. Okay, hold on. You can't just sell prisons like they're cars or real estate or hamburgers. <laughs> then why don't you tell that to Tom Beasley, the co-founder of CCA, who once said, you just sell prisons like you were selling cars or real estate or hamburgers. CCA, can I take your order? I'll have a number seven with uh, extra solitary cells, electric fence, and Small onion right there. Yeah, super and they rake in a ton of scratch. Last year, CCA took in $1.7 billion. This is so good, it's criminal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, maybe it's okay because they're saving the taxpayer money. <laughs> Sorry, the sales pitch was wrong. The data shows that private prisons cost the taxpayers just as much as regular prisons. And today, nearly one-fifth of federal prisoners are held in a for-profit facility. Okay, no, no. Ah, graffiti! That's an infraction. A beautiful one. Are you Banksy? Oh my gosh, I already got an infraction? They must give out a lot of these. Oh yeah, that's not a coincidence. One study showed that private prisons dole out twice as many infractions as government prisons. Not having enough infractions. That's an infraction. These penalties can lengthen your sentence, which earns the company even more cash. Oh, so the more people that are in prison, the more money they make. Ooh, that's dirty. Yep, that's why private prisons sneak occupancy clauses into their contracts, which actually require states to keep prisons full. Last year, a private prison in Arizona didn't make their 97% capacity quota, so the state government had to pay them a $3 million fine. Fines like that incentivize cash-trapped states to keep people in prison as long as possible. Your parole forms are in order, and you've been a model prisoner. So we're going to <clears throat> lock you back up. We really can't afford to pay another fine. That's reprehensible. Look, not all prisons are private prisons, but this one is. So no, its purpose isn't to stop crime. It's the dollar dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> can't believe all this has been happening, and I didn't even know. I mean, I've never really thought about prison, like, at all. Hey, pulling back the curtain on our disturbing business practices, that's an infraction. Hey, that makes three infractions. We're gonna go to solitary. Oh, okay, that doesn't sound so bad. You know, peace and quiet, do some meditation. No, solitary confinement is a cruel and inhumane punishment that has no place in modern society. Wait, what? Uh, we'll tell you about it after you get settled in the hole. No, tell me no! So maybe some really surprising information in that video. These private prisons, like it was said, are essentially just businesses that profit off of keeping people incarcerated. So as a result, private prisons try to extend the sentences for their prisoners. They're really not concerned about helping their prisoners in any way, about getting them reintegrated into society. They're just money-hungry capitalist organizations that are trying to make a profit out of keeping people in jail. And like it was said in the video, it doesn't save taxpayers money, uh, and prisons are exceptionally expensive uh, institutions. A lot of scholars actually think of prisons as a modern day form of slavery. Roughly half of all imprisoned American citizens work full-time jobs while serving time. 
Um, the original idea behind prison labor was that job skills would help people re-enter into society. However, most of the jobs assigned to prisoners are not skill building jobs. They just involve maintaining the prison itself. Um, the average wage state uh, wage in state prisons is only 20 cents per hour, and in federal prisons, the wage is 31 cents per hour.